Hello and welcome to the Indian Ocean World podcast. My name is Philip Gooding. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Indian Ocean World Centre, McGill University. In this podcast, I am joined by Professor Sugata Ray, an Associate Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art in the History of Art Department and the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at University of California, Berkeley. He is trained in both history and art, and his research focuses on climatic and environmental change and the visual arts since circa 1500. His first book, published in 2019 with University of Washington Press, was entitled Climate Change and the Art of Devotion, Geoaesthetics in the Land of Krishna, 1550 to 1850. And this examines the interrelationship between matter and life in shaping creative practices in the Hindu pilgrimage site of Braj during the eco-catastrophes of the Little Ice Age. It was awarded the 2021 Alice Davis Hitchcock Medallion by the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain, as well as the 2020 Religion and the Arts Book Award by the American Academy of Religion. He has also published and co-edited volume with Venugopal Madipati entitled Water Histories of South Asia, the Materiality of Liquescence with Routledge in 2020. Now, his research is focusing on animal histories with a project entitled Anthropocene Extinction and the Making of the Early Modern World. And it is with this project that we're going to discuss broadly today. Professor Ray, thank you so much for agreeing to this recording. I just want to start with um, a very broad question just about your research. Clearly, your research has used an art historical lens to traverse several themes in environment and history in South Asia. Your first book links climatic changes during the Little Ice Age to art and spiritual devotion. Your recent co-edited volume is a water history. Uh, now you are focusing on animals and extinction. Perhaps you could tell us how you came to this latest project, uh, what you aim to do with it, and also how it relates to your previous work. Thank you, Philip, and thank you for a very kind introduction. It's really wonderful to be part of this conversation. And um, let me try it put succinctly. <laughs> how did I come to this project? So my first book essentially focused on how the religious cultures of North India were transformed by climatic, uh, the transformations in the climatic, in the climatic history, for instance, of the Little Ice Age. So as I was wrapping up my first book project, I really wanted to think more carefully about what art history as a discipline can offer in these conversations that are really a happening across across fields and one of one of something that really really I, I was very interested in thinking about is is how to go back to the origins of art history and its enlightenment rationality and trying to think about how do we sort of rethink the role of visual culture and rethink the role of of material circulating plants circulating animals circulating across the world with the Colombian exchange. And one thing that really struck me is that art history as a discipline, like many forms of cultural histories, takes the human being, the human species as, as a locus of analysis. So typically, whether it's literary histories or art history, we talk about human patrons, human artists, human actors. So what does it mean to deracinate the discipline? and deracinate that enlightenment rationality of the discipline. So that is where I wanted to move towards a broader arena, thinking about uh, extinction and really sort of to abandon this sort of a totalizing social, technological, artistic, or even political arrangement that remains moved to a specific post 16th century anthropocentric consciousness that commenced with the uh, you know, with the European colonial expansion expansion. So with my current theme, I want to develop this further and really look at what what is what is the Anthropocene and how do we write the origin story of the Anthropocene? I mean, of course, as I'm sure you're aware of this. I mean, there's a lot of scholarship on the Anthropocene, and some argue that it, it one has to think about the design of a steam engine in 1784 as a sort of the moment of the Anthropocene, or others have argued for atomic testing in the 60s as the period that uh, that really led to the commencement of this current geological epoch. So what I want to do in this current book is actually sort of rethink the origin story because it matters, because 
the origin stories matter in terms of trying to think about responsibilities. And what happens if we take uh, European ecological imperialism from the 1500s as the origin story of our current uh, mass biodiversity extinction? Of course, this is not, I'm not the only person to argue this. There, Catherine Yusuf, for instance, has, uh, has written about this or the scholars from the sciences have also tried to think about what happens to, uh, to the history of the present when we trace our origin to, let's say, ex colonial expansionism as compared to the Industrial Revolution. And we know that that uh, even uh, by the loss of vertebrate animal species has moved forward really 25 times faster since 1500 than during the fifth mass extinction. So that's where, where I wanted to sort of expand my arena of, of analysis and try to think about uh, the histories, the genealogies of, uh, of our ecological present, and to think about the epistemological function of the global, especially, not to, not to, of course, to, to indicate the degree of responsibility rather than primacy of colonial artistic regimes in framing ecocide as the story of our modernity. I could I could go on. So <laughs> no, no, I, I, that's a really interesting, a really interesting insight into it. And thank you for kind of showing that genealogy of how your research has developed over time. So in advance of this podcast, as for our listeners, uh, um, Professor Ray kindly shared with us a couple of articles. Uh, the the two ones that we that we're particularly interested in. There's one entitled "From New Spain to Mughal India: Rethinking Early Modern Animal Studies with a Turkey," and the other one was entitled "Dead as a Dodo." Anthropocene extinction in the early modern world. Now, one of the things that you wrestle with in both of these articles, and you kind of alluded to it in your answer uh, to the first question, was how. Um, so you're focusing more now on so on animals within this kind of understanding this Anthropocene from European colonization from around circa 1500. But focusing on animals, I think, is fairly is is a very novel and very interesting. Something that really struck me from your pieces that I was very, I suppose, taken by. And one of the challenges that you wrestle with is the erasure of animal agency uh, and experiences in not just in art history but across um, academic disciplines. And I was really found it incredibly interesting the way you try to cut across this. Um, not just by thinking about the images and the reports of animals, but also their journeys, and by highlighting how imperialism, museums, and research institutions in the present um, have contributed to the erasure. I wonder, could you speak um, more to the challenges of this effort um, at its importance, especially in the age of the Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction event currently unfolding? Uh, thank you for that question. And I think it's a fundamental question of animal studies, as you've also worked on it. So uh, I, I, the question, of course, is comes from this idea that we can recover the animal in history. And, and the scholars as Erica Fudge have actually written about this question is that, I mean, obviously, from within sort of the larger post-colonial rubric, the seminal essay would be Gayatri Spirak's Can the Subaltern Speak? And in a way that has influenced animal studies and like, is there an animal in history? Or, or what are our archives to access the, the real animal? So I think in a way, a lot of post-colonial scholarship sort of takes, sort of offers a critique of, of a certain liberal understanding of history, a liberal understanding that, that the archive the historical archive can allow us to recuperate the agency of the of the non-human animal. But again, if you think about art history or any forms of history writing, it is a species-centric archive. I mean, whether we're talking about art or literature or whether we're talking about actual documents in the historical archive, it always, it, it, the limits of the archive in a way, see, uh, provides us with a methodological challenge to think about the historical animal. And for me, that becomes an important question, especially when we talk about colonialism, because the, the resonances of, of animal studies and sort of post-colonial scholarship, I mean, there is a, a certain intersection in this, this idea that can we recover the voice of a subalt, you know, can we, if, and then the animal becomes that irreducible other, so for me, that was a sort of a methodological challenge to think about this question. And especially when history or art history has its roots in a certain enlightenment rationality, can we, can we unmoor our engagement with the past from our speciesist bias? And what 
do we stand to gain from such an unmooring? So that was broadly where I'm trying to think through these, uh, the question of, of, let's say, with the, the essay on the dodo is of, of a species that really has been mocked, ridiculed. I mean, the idea of the dead as a dodo, the fat dodo, and we keep hearing these sort of uh, metaphors that, that are used to talk about uh, colonialism and, and extinction. And I find it intriguing that, in a way, the archive produces that animal. So if there if there is a real animal, it's our access to that real animal is not through, is through a certain mediated archive where you have all sorts of xenophobic, uh, all sorts of uh, structures of knowledge production that 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 articulate a certain otherness. So for me, the turkey in a way, my interest in the turkey was slightly different, and my essay on the dodo that's forthcoming. Uh, really is going to the heart of this question of how do we write histories of extinction that that enca- that that can how do we work with a with a species level archive when we are going to talk, write about the non human are there ways to even access or maybe perhaps there is a limit to what we can do as historians and art historians. Or if there is a limit, I think you're doing a great job at pushing it. So that's 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 uh, a, a really interesting take, and I, I really appreciate it. So let's go a little bit deeper on, on the turkey then, because there are significant contrasts between the, the the turkey piece and the dodo piece. So let's let's start on the on the turkey. Um, your starting point is um, Mansur's picture of a turkey from around 1612, and then you go into a lot more depth in terms of seeing it as, I suppose, a biopolitical marvel. So it goes from uh, simply a picture to something that means a lot more lo- a, a lot more than that. Um, I suppose first question about this is actually kind of methodological. How did you come across this picture? Can you describe this picture? Uh, and I suppose the painting's uh, significance as well, just kind of in the, in the, in the history of uh, the movable court. So the painting uh, by Mansour is really one of the most famous paintings by Mansour. And I think the the... the especially that because it represents a North American Turkey, uh, mm. it sort of signals towards that exchange between the Americas and uh, South Asia that opens up new avenues of, of circulation that, that is not just between Europe and, and, and India, so, or even East Africa and, and, and sort of the West Coast of India. So I think for that reason, the, the painting has always sort of uh, attracted scholar, art historical attention. And also there is an art historical importance of the painting in terms of, of it being a tasri or a picture of a bird. So it's, it's a portrait of a bird. So from the early 20th century, art historians have written about this painting and it's really become a keystone in thinking about, uh, about natural history in the early modern period in South Asia, especially under Jahangir, who was known to have observed nature. He writes about it in the Jahangir Nama, and then he commissions his court painter Mansur uh, to paint this particular bird because, again, I think it's very interesting is that because he says that words are not enough to describe this, this marvelous animal from elsewhere. So I think the role of, of illustrating natural history, which, as we know, has all has been so central to European natural history. Do, we don't talk much about it in, in early modern South Asia, but we, with Mansur, we can think about how the role of representation of visualizing, visualizing becomes such a key aspect of documenting the natural environment. So that's where, where scholarship has sort of focused on trying to see a compa- comparing European natural history in the early modern period with natural history in the Mughal Empire and trying to talk about scientificism. All that, all, all that conversation is important. It sort of tries to think about the role of science in early modern South Asia. But for me, I was more interested in this particular uh, painting from the perspective of an animal studies perspective. And if you think about uh, art history, especially on South Asia, typically when when non-human animals are discussed, it's always as sort of a spectacle, that's biopower. It's like the emperor who who is pre- who's presented the giraffe or the zebra or the turkey. So it's never, it's always about the emperor or the artist. So my question 
coming from the sort of the genealogy of critical animal studies is that we don't take the animal seriously. We've never actually taken the turkey or the zebra seriously. It's always about Mansur. It's always about the artist. It's always about the patron. Uh, we know that that in the Indian Ocean world, animals were routinely circulating, circulating elephants, zebras, giraffes, rhinos, and these were part of a diplomatic gift exchange or even imperial spectacles, I think, uh, as a form of biopolitical power. But to me, then, if we rethink that painting, if we re-look at, look at the painting once more as sort of, uh, as a sort of a transcript of that interspecies continuum. Like, again, going back to my idea that what is our archive, if you want to think about that animal, that real animal, that turkey that reached the Mughal court in 1612, the turkey has not left a trace in the archive. It's, it's only through Mansur, this painting, that we can obliquely access that moment when the artist encountered the animal. So for me, that become that became the sort of the entry point to think about this particular painting of the turkey as as a sort of a transcript of that interspecies continuum or interspecies encounter between the Mughal emperor, his court artist, and this bird from far, far away. And that just seems like such an important perspective to take, just in given the the uh, current moment. Uh, with the with the acknowledgement of the Anthropocene and its many critics, and the, with in, in, during this mass, sixth mass extinction event. So uh, thank you really very much for that. So one of the things that maybe you could speak to this within this kind of uh, moment within this Anthropocene and the sixth mass extinction event, we have this kind of representation of a turkey as just being this marvel, biopolitical marvel, and at the same time we have the dodo, which is becoming. Um, well, it's being joked about and it's being made extinct. I suppose, could you speak to that contrast a little bit? How did the, both of these kind of narratives help us to understand what the Anthropocene what and what the causes of this sixth mass extinction event are? It's what is interesting about, like, if I were to read these two essays together, which I actually did not, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, it's, the turkey is ever present. And I think, Someone who, who teaches in North America, I mean, you can't avoid the turkey, so Thanksgiving and so on and so forth. Uh, so for me, it, it was about a bird that is so common, at least in the North American context, versus a bird that is extinct, a bird that only exists in representation, a bird that only exists in, in, in our, our archives. So for me, the idea was to sort of denaturalize the turkey and try to think about that something that is so common, that is that is so everyday for, at least in the North American context, has this very complex history within a global uh, flow. And again, the importance for me with the Turkey was to think about the Indian Ocean world in this story, because there is some scholar, I mean, there's some, there's a lot of scholarship on the Turkey from art history, from history, but it's usually about the relationship between Europe and the Americas, and it's it's seen as a form of ecological imperialism, the way that uh, scholars would think about how the turkey becomes a metaphor or a symbol of, of Europe's colonization of America. So for me, what is important, what was important was to think about, about uh, Mughal India, especially, or even, even China, where, where, where these frameworks of ecological imperialism were not operative at a global scale. So the Mughals did not have any ambition, imperialist ambitions in the Northern Hemisphere or even in the Americas. So what the Turkey means in, in Mughal India is very different from what the Turkey means in, in, in Europe in this period. And I wanted to sort of try to take us beyond that framework of thinking about plants, animals from, from the Americas, from Africa, from Asia, as they circulate globally, is there a way to think about it beyond Europe's ecological imperialism? So that was perhaps what I was trying to do with the dodo is that how do you read the global history of the bird? And truly a global history of the bird that is not just about Europe and its other 
But if you bring in the Mughals here, if you bring in other contexts here, like what is the global history of the bird? Are there frameworks of thinking about the Turkey that's not just framed within uh, European ecological imperialism? So that was perhaps what I wanted to do with the Turkey, to think about the, the exotic or the foreign or the other in a context that is not structured by extractive uh, ecological imperialism. But with the Dodo, on the other hand, I am squarely addressing that question. I'm squarely addressing the question of what is ecological imperialism and how do we write a history of the world where we see again Europe as not primary, but as responsible. So for the Turkey piece, for instance, my, my object was Mansu's painting of the Turkey. Uh, but Mansu also painted a dodo, which is very interesting, which is now in, 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 in Russia, uh, the painting. So, but in this essay, I actually don't look at Mansu's painting of the dodo, but I'm looking at European, Western, specifically Western European representations of the, of the dodo to sort of think about how, how do we think about um, ecocide as the de facto story of Europe's modernity. So I think for me, these two essays were trying to do two different things. And I will write about Mansu's painting of the dodo at some point, but for me, this particular essay on the dodo was actually holding Western European ecological imperialism in this period as directly responsible for our current predicament. I very much look forward to seeing that alternative framing of uh, the history of the dodo because I am very, very much only aware of the, the Western centric one, which you so elaborately and uh, concisely uh, summed up in your in your article. Um, I also very much like your your framing of it, is like the idea of Europe being not primary and um, but responsible, and that kind of really links the two articles in a really lovely way as well. As one of one of the things that comes through in both the articles as well, I'm struck by how you highlight the etymology of both um, dodo and turkey in English and other languages. And I wondered what this philological focus reveals and how does this uh, data complement, I suppose, other archives in the, the way you're in linking history, art history and uh, animal studies here? I think names matter, especially when you're talking about an animal called turkey. Uh, I think it, it really matters for me in trying to think about how, how nomenclature defines our understanding of the environment when we call a bird turkey, whereas in Turkey, the bird is called Hind coming from India. So in a way, how, how etymological namings are really connected to geopolitical understandings of the world. And uh, even with the dodo, for instance, now if you think about the word dodo, if you call someone a dodo, it's already a metaphor for stupidity or a metaphor for uh, like someone who's not able to cope with, with, with life. So I think how we name plants, how we name animals says much about our understanding of the environment and sort of our projections. And I think that to, 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 un to work through that is important to show how how, how naming is never innocent. The project of giving a name is never innocent. And so I think that's where it's important, at least for me, it was important, both with the turkey and with the dodo to actually uh, sort of trace the ways in which the simple act of naming was sort of tied up to such large, to a larger political, cultural, social, and economic understanding of the environment. In fact, uh, the fray I, as I was trying to, I was doing research for the Dodo essay, I realized that Charles Dickens was actually the, used the phrase dead as a Dodo for the first time. And so it's very interesting, like how to think about what does dead as a Dodo mean? I mean, it's a common term, common phrase now, but that embedded within that, phrase is, is a deep, his, long history of ecological imperialism, violence, and, and, and sort of the, the role of Europe in, in shaping our basic, our very understanding of the world. So names matter. <laughs> and you've just demonstrated exactly the, how that is the case. Um, so thank you very much for that. I, mean, I, I mentioned right in the introduction, um, your project is entitled um, Anthropocene Extinction and the making of the early modern world. Uh, would you mind just uh, talking about, I suppose, the, not so much, what can we expect from you in the near future? Maybe partly a, a dodo paper from uh, Mansur's paintings, but uh, what are you working on? What can, what can we uh, be excited about seeing from you uh, in the vaguely near future? 
difficult question because I'm supposed to be writing the book right now. So, so I am actually working on this particular book on, on, on extinction and proposing extinction in the early modern world. So I have a set of other essays coming out in the next couple of months, including an essay on monsoons, an essay on climate resilience. But my main, main project right now is trying to wrap up this book where I'm looking at each chapter in a way looks at a specific species that are either endangered or extinct and put in an extinct because of European ecological imperialism. Uh, so trying to think about, let's say, the dodo or even uh, Seychelles nuts, which is an endangered species right now. So the whole point of this project is really to think about uh, the Indian Ocean, not just as sort of an inert space through which objects travel, people travel, but to see how the Indian Ocean in a way is precious archive, precious how we think about early modern connectivities or even global global networks. So not just as sort of a horizontal space over which people travel, but what about sort of the, 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 the species that live in the in the ocean and how were they affected by by climatic transformations that were happening in the, from the 16th century onwards. So each chapter of this book will look at a specific species that uh, that were uh, that were valued for their aesthetic uh, aesthetic value value for the aesthetic value. That's not a very nice phrase, but <laughs> but essentially looking at uh, objects that really were collected. And then the other thing that I really want to do with this project is again try to think about uh, archives outside Western Europe and think about what the dodo, for instance, means in Mughal India. It's very different from what the dodo means when it's collected in, in, in let's say, Western Europe and trying to see these various contrasting notions of the environment and notions of the ocean as well. When we're talking about the species, when you talk about uh, these species, we cannot actually distinguish water from those the pl animals and plants that live in water and how, how different oceanic imageries were imaginaries were emerging in the 16th century and how we try to think about this sort of a history of really 14 percent of the earth's surface and depth of course that, that, that's fantastic I, I really look forward to hearing this the, the idea of a, the uh, a human uh, climate environment animal nexus in the indian ocean world in the early modern indian ocean world, that sounds it's, it's heartbreaking and i really look forward to hearing and reading more about it um, thank you so much for recording with us, uh, Professor Zagadhare, uh, for your answers and for, and for giving us an insight into what's coming up next in your research. Um, for all listeners who want to find out more from uh, Professor Ray's uh, research, um, there are some links in the description. We'll put links to um, the article on the early modern Turkey in uh, the Mughal Empire, but everyone will have to wait for the one on the dodo. Um, and we'll have links to various others pieces of um, Professor Ray's research as well. Um, I would thank also uh, Sam Riemann, uh, who organized and produced this podcast, uh, and to you, the listener, for downloading or streaming this podcast wherever you are. Uh, once again, my name is Philip Gooding, and you've been listening to the Indian Ocean World podcast. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The Indian Ocean World podcast is produced under the Shirk-funded partnership Appraising Risk Past and Present. The podcast runs in conjunction with the annual speaker series at the Indian Ocean World Centre at McGill University, Montreal. On the podcast next week, we will be joined by Dr. Julia Young Haynes of Cornell University. There will be no podcast the following week as the IOWC hosts Professor Leslie Orr of Concordia University for an in-person talk. Please contact the centre for details.